All right, what is going on, everybody? How is everybody doing today? Welcome back here today to another episode of the Just Ballin Podcast. Today, I'm gonna be doing kind of a reverse episode of what I did last week. And I'm going to talk about my 10 most surprising players this season in a good way. So last week, I kind of was not negative, but I think players I talked about top 10 disappointing guys this season where I was just kind of like upset with how their 2024 season has happened. Either I had high expectations for them. Maybe they were a rookie. Like I talked about Scoot Henderson, just thought I would see a little bit more from him in his rookie season. And I did mention like those players aren't bad. I mentioned good players. I mentioned Mikel Bridges. I mentioned Darius Garland. I mentioned Scoot Henderson, but guys, I think that could have taken a step this year. Like we thought Mikel Bridges could have been a star he could have won most improved player this year and we didn't see that so today we're going to be a little bit more positive i want to talk about the um i want to talk about top 10 most surprising players in this league at the end i'm going to talk about uh kind of my reaction to the men's elite eight i'm going to talk about a, a little bit of the women's um and then my predictions for the final four um or maybe that will come later this week and then i want to talk about the women's elite eight as well um got to watch that but i'm a very casual like college women's basketball viewer but you'll get my casual take about that at the end but we got 10 players here kind of 11 the 10th spot um or like just at the end i'm going to talk about two guys um for kind of the same reason and i wanted to apologize no episode yesterday on monday i like to keep the monday wednesday friday schedule i think that's been working for me so far but I was traveling to New York over the weekend for kind of Easter holidays and stuff like that. Um, that's kind of where I'm from. So I just didn't get really a chance to record a podcast. So um, we're back here today, back in uh, Philadelphia. And I, I really got to work on my studio behind me if you are watching on YouTube. But um, yeah, I want to talk about 10 guys today. We are getting towards the end of the NBA season. Man, it's a... It's a dog, like it's like a, a dog fight to try to like get your correct seating here in both conferences right now. Like the West is so competitive, um, at, at least... From the like, I guess the Clippers are probably gonna get that four spot. You'd think they don't pull the two game lead, but like five to nine is a three and a half game um, difference. And then even in the Eastern Conference as well, with the Bucks kind of getting the two spot, but then you have the Cavs all the way down to the Sixers, like a three and a half spot as well, or or I guess it's a five game spot. Um, shout out to the Bulls for clinching a playing tournament appearance. We'll see kind of the same thing with the Hawks soon. Sorry, Brooklyn, you aren't going to be making the playing tournament. So speaking of Chicago, though, I'm just going to start off with my most improved player pick this season, Kobe White. Um, I've been pretty vocal why I think Kobe White should be the most improved player because we saw how good Tyrese Maxey was last year for the Philadelphia 76ers. And I do think he would have been most improved player this year if it wasn't for Kobe White's kind of jump and his leap that he's taken in this year in what year number five of his career um kobe white uh just was pretty much a bench guy last year for the bulls he appeared in 74 games he didn't even hit 10 points a night in around 23 minutes a game and this year we have seen him be probably the second best bowl overall and even at times the best ball i know like overall this season DeRozan is still the best player on this team but you're probably like the, the most excited bulls fans are about any player on the squad is kobe white because he signed a fantastic contract with the bulls in the offseason where he's going to be basically making 11 million dollars this year 12 million next year and 13 million dollars in 2026 not a player option that he could opt out of a full-on guaranteed deal and that is phenomenal value for Chicago. I think the leap we've seen Kobe White from being just an okay bench guy to being one of the better combo guards in this league now he's not like in the Devin Booker, Donovan Mitchell, Anthony Edwards like even a Jalen Brunson tier right but someone that appeared in just pretty much a little bit more games than last year he'll finish with and he has started in all but one game this season so a full-time starter obviously there's been the injuries to Levine and we've seen him really emerge as a true good offensive weapon there's been a little inconsistencies as of late but he's still a phenomenal player this year I still think he should win most improved if it goes to Maxi, I get it I just think that for Tyrese Maxi, we knew this jump was going to happen with the increase in opportunity once James Harden got moved and he was really good last year as well and you know what Maxi has led that team and kept them alive um with Joel Embiid out and they're still going to be maybe a playing tournament team we'll see if they get that sixth spot but I think what Kobe White has looked at is like a, a okay bench score to being a true like top three guy on this Bulls team this year at times the best guy probably overall the second best guy this year and I think a bit better building block than Zach Levine is going forward contract obviously plays a role in that but a phenomenal uh 23 year old season from Kobe White who is shooting 
um, pretty well, like 40, around 45% from the field on seven more attempts from last year. And the volume or the efficiency is kind of stayed the same from the field, which is good. Like you're taking seven and a half more shots tonight and your efficiency hasn't dropped. That's impressive. His three point shot has actually gone up and he's taking around two and a half more attempts a night from downtown. The free throw percentage is still good. Uh, it's still like around 84, 85%. He's getting to the line, obviously a little bit more. He's upped his playmaking ability. He's upped his rebounding. Like he's obviously out there more. So he's going to have better stats. And I just think we didn't really see this at all from Kobe White. I was a huge fan of him coming out of UNC because I follow UNC very closely. He's like, they're I mean, I went to Temple, so Temple's not like the greatest basketball school. And I was always a fan of UNC growing up with like Ty Lawson, Marcus Page, uh, Joel Berry, all those guys, obviously. And like Kobe White came, was solid at UNC, gets drafted in the top 10 in 2019, had a fine rookie season, kind of improved in year two and year three, but year four last year was not a good year. Chicago, shout out to like Carney Sovas for this deal because he hasn't made a lot of great deals as the Bulls GM, but this one was fantastic. Getting him on that contract, seeing the value in Kobe White and should be their starting either point guard or shooting guard going forward. There should be no ifs, ands, or buts. He should be on the Bulls till for at least the next seven seasons, right? So he is now a franchise building block for this team and something we thought he was just a complimentary piece when he re-signed with them in the offseason. So shout out to Kobe White this year. Is my most improved player. If he doesn't win it, it's Maxi. I get it. I'm a big Tyrese Maxi fan. I predicted him to win that award in the beginning of the year. So I'll take a victory lap there, but I think it should go to Kobe White. I've changed my mind. I think if Kobe White just maybe improved a little bit from last year. It should go to Tyrese Maxey. But I think the jump we've seen from Kobe, um, because we thought his career was kind of on the other way, like he was kind of playing worse and worse, basically since his sophomore year, which was very encouraging, um, it felt like. So yeah, shout out to Kobe White. He wanted to be the first guy, like I wanted him to be the first guy that I mentioned this year because I do think he's my most improved player. And it surprised me a ton in so many good ways. All right, so next up, I want to talk about somebody that should also finish probably third in the most improved player voting, and that's Jalen Johnson of the Atlanta Hawks. Johnson's in year three, which is like a perfect year to win this most improved player. Like that seems to be a trend um, that we've seen in the past. And Johnson's like... Um, freshman season at Duke got cut short. Um, there was like things that he just wanted to prepare for the draft. There was some like off the court issues. He only appeared in 13 games after being a top recruit to Duke. Um, there looked like there was some possible playmaking, um, I guess, weaknesses or issues. And like, maybe he wouldn't be the best shot creator in the world, but it was an up and down Duke, uh, Duke season in 2021. Uh, I was fine with him going where he went in the 2021 draft when that happened. He was the 20th overall pick, and I thought the upside play was there, and I thought that was a good selection for the Hawks. After his rookie year, I was like, you know what? All right, maybe this is fine. He had to probably get a little bit acclimated to the NBA level. Last year, though, I thought we were going to see a little bit more volume from uh, Jalen Johnson. I mean, in 2020, like in that 2021 draft, the Hawks were coming off that Eastern Conference Finals appearance where they beat the Sixers. They um, played the Bucs and played well against them and they overachieved that year. And that maybe hurt them a little bit more than you would have liked it to because they thought maybe they were a lot better than um, than what they actually were. And Jalen Johnson, like obviously didn't play a lot in that following year, which like I said, 22 games a night for a rookie, it makes sense. Last year though, I thought we were gonna see a little bit more from Jalen Johnson. And I thought like the athleticism was there. I'm like, this could be a solid rotation piece. I was a little worried about the jumper because it did not look great in this first two years. And I'll be a limited sample size though. So it's not like we got a ton of looks at Jalen Johnson, but man, this guy also looks like a building block for this Hawks team, man. What a year three for Jalen Johnson on both ends of the floor. Um, the athleticism is there. The jump shot is back to what it was looking like at Duke that we did not see basically since the 2021 collegiate season. So it's been like two years since we saw like this jumper from Jalen Johnson, and this year, obviously a much more expanded role. The Hawks have had their injuries to Quinn Capella, Nneka Kungwu, Trey Young, um, Sadiq Bey, obviously, the whole thing with a um, AJ Griffin on and off the floor, um, who I don't, did I mention him in my top 10 disappointing players? I did. Yeah, who was like obviously disappointing this year, um, but Jalen Johnson though, phenomenal year. He's shooting 35% from three on just under four attempts a night, 51% from the field on 12 shots a night. So he's tripled the amount of shots from year two to year three. And he appeared in 70 games last year. He's also doubled his minutes as well. He's had his injuries this year also for the Hawks, but when he's on the floor, he's a good playmaker. He's a fantastic rebounder for kind of his position. He's a good inside scorer. Like I said, the jumper has looked so clean this year. Pretty much what we saw at Duke that we saw the potential in him when he was a freshman as a Blue Devil. And just, I think like as the athleticism rolling to the rim, a good pick and pop partner with Trey Young um, and someone that's also, I think, great in transition also. So when Jalen Johnson is healthy, man, and we're going to see him play around 55-ish games this year, a little bit more than that, like that's a good enough sample size with the amount of volume we have seen. Like he's slotting in next year as a starting three 
or the starting four. I mean, he is 6'9", and he is a good jumper. Like, And I think he's fine enough defensively. I, I mean, I don't think it's the best in the world, but I think it's good enough where you can play him at the four. The advanced numbers look good, um, and it's a very encouraging sign from Jalen Johnson in year number three. And you'd have to think, like, when you're ranking, like, the, the guys that have the most trade value on this Hawks team— He's probably second. You may be able to get a little bit more for Jalen Johnson because he's still on that rookie contract than you could for DeJounte Murray. Or it's very similar um, after Trey Young. And I think like if the Hawks came down, like we can only keep or we only want to keep Murray or Johnson. I think they're taking Jalen Johnson, which is crazy because a year ago, you did not think that Jalen Johnson, really nobody, maybe outside of some Hawks fans, some Duke fans, um, thought that Jalen Johnson was going to take this year three jump. I thought we were going to see maybe just like a, like a season where he could have averaged close to 10 points a night and just saw like minor improvements from year two and just kind of keep going in that right direction. But he is fully breaking out this year. If it wasn't for Kobe White, I think Jalen Johnson could have a very good reason for being most improved up there with Tyrese Maxey. I'm not going to talk about outpouring Shane Goon because I saw this jump kind of going from his rookie year to his sophomore year to this year. But um, yeah, Jalen Johnson has taken like a similar jump than Shane Goon. Obviously not as valuable and not as good, but still a fantastic year from Jalen Johnson. Wanted to give him some love. I was very impressed from this season. I did not expect him to be this good in year three. So shout out to Jalen Johnson, who hopefully is averaging like the second most points on this Hawks team next year. Okay, we are going to talk about another Jalen, and that's Jalen Williams, J-Dub of the OKC Thunder. Another guy that could be considered for most improved player. I hate that sophomore is like should even be in consideration for that role, but people will talk about him because of the improvement from year one to year two. I'm just so surprised that he's this good already. Like, we talk about the OKC Thunder, like, when DeMonta Sabonis was available, when Kevin Durant was available, like, when all these guys have kind of been traded and the Thunder have this chess piece of just draft picks and all these young assets that we're like, okay, who's going to be that next star to pair up with Shea in OKC? I think they have it. I think they have it on the roster in Jalen Williams. Like the reason why I also wanted to make this podcast episode for you guys, like I watching the Knicks Thunder game on what was that Saturday night, Sunday night, Sunday night, like how good he was with Shea kind of being off that night. And this man is such an efficient scorer on kind of floaters and fadeaways and mid-range jumpers. He is such a fun player to watch in this league. He's still just 22 years old. Um, he's going to be 23 very soon. Um, he was a little bit older coming out of Santa Clara. I was like, he would have probably made this list last year if I made a podcast on this because I did not expect him to be this good right away from Santa Clara and just improving this year. Overall as a playmaker, overall as a defender, Jalen Williams has been a very good defender for the Thunder this year. You can make an argument he's been like the third best overall defender behind Chet and Shea. I think there's good enough arguments from what I've been reading, the advanced data, and just eye test that he's a better defender than Lou Dort this year. I think people are kind of indifferent on Wu Dort's defense this season as a whole, but the volume is up. The efficiency is up. He's taking four more shots overall per night this year than he did last year, and he has gone up from 52% from the field to 54%. He's taking more threes a night, two and a half last year to three and a half this year. He's gone up from 35% from three from his rookie season to 43% from three. He's shooting 43% from three. That is mind-blowing for a 22-year-old. He's a good free throw shooter, consistent 80 plus percent from the line, solid rebounder. Like I said, great defender, good playmaker, and he can get to whatever shot he wants on the floor. He is fantastic, fantastic in the half-court offense. And I'm excited to do my top 25 under 25 list because I think Jalen Williams should be higher than Chet Holmgren. And obviously, you have your Anthony Edwards, your Victor Wimbanyamas of the world, and Luka until he's... Well, I think Luka, did he just turn 25 this year or did he just turn 24? Luka turned 25. Okay, so Luka's like graduated from that list. Like, Jalen Williams has a chance to be top five in my top 25 under 25. Like, there's a good debate between him and Paolo Bancaro. I'm super high on Jalen Williams. He's one of my favorite players to watch in the league right now. And I think he's going to be a star for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Like I said, and when I started talking about him, could they get another start of pair with Shea? I think they have him on the roster in Jalen Williams, man. This is a phenomenal player, a phenomenal sidekick to Shea. And I wanted to give some love to Jalen Williams this year because I did not see this jump from his rookie year in which he impressed me and it was a surprising rookie year to just uh his sophomore year jump he's been phenomenal shout out to jalen williams third guy i'm gonna mention all right i didn't plan this but we're gonna talk about three jalen's in a row jalen sugg so joining jalen johnson is another guy from that 2021 draft class and will be the last we're not gonna talk about any more guys from that class here um in this episode but suggs 
was one of my favorite players to watch at Gonzaga. Obviously, he hit that half court against UCLA in the tournament, and he was a fun player there. He was obviously a top recruit, um, and he was pretty good. Like, he was a good three-point shooter um, on his volume. He was a good playmaker, good rebounder, had great size, um, good ball handling ability, great defensive potential. And when he didn't go to the Raptors at four, I was shocked. I was like, really? Like, I thought Jalen Suggs would have been a perfect fit with Siakam at the time and Ananobi in Toronto. Um, and then... It looks like, obviously, hindsight, Raptors made the right decision going with Scotty Barnes. Scotty Barnes is better and has a higher potential than Suggs from what we've seen. But I was worried about Suggs' year one efficiency. It was gross. I know the Magic obviously weren't great. They ended up getting the number one overall pick to pair up um, or get Paolo Bancaro on the team. But that Magic team was not good in 22. And obviously, with rookie guards, if inefficiencies are there, like he shot 36% from the field, he shot 20, it was 21% from three. Um, and he was not like the best free throw shooter. And it just didn't look comfortable out there. He was turn the ball over a ton, but that's what we get in rookie guards. Like that's normal. Year two last year though, is where I was like starting to get worried about Jalen Suggs. Cause I was like, the defense is there. He's a good hustle player, but I was like, oh man. Like I thought coming out of Gonzaga, elite point guard potential, elite combo guard potential. Maybe it was never going to average eight, nine assists a night, but was going to be somebody that could actually be an efficient scorer, a good three point shooter, create his own shot and be able to run that half court offense. And after what I saw in the 23 season, I was like, okay, that is not what I'm seeing in Jalen Suggs. We have to completely change our, I guess, view on what he could be as a player, because I think at least for me, I was wrong evaluating him as a prospect and what he could be at the NBA level. And I kind of realized that last year watching him for the magic, but this year, man, I love this role for Jalen Suggs. This is where he's going to make his money, man. Maybe he's not going to be uh, De'Aaron Fox in this league or somebody like that, but he could be a Marcus Smart in this league and know his role and do it so, so well. The Magic are one of the best defensive teams in the Eastern Conference this year, and Jalen Suggs may be their best defender overall. He should be on an all-defensive team. He could even be on all-defensive first team for how good he's been this year as a defender for this Magic team. Point of attack, help defender, just an overall like disruptor on that end of the floor. His scoring though, like he's averaging a career high in points, 12 and a half, but the efficiency, oh my God, he found his stroke, man. 46% from the field, 40% from three on five attempts a night. That is night and day from his rookie year where he took four attempts a night his rookie year and shot 21% from three. And this year, 40% from three on five attempts a night. The free throw shooting has still been kind of consistent around that 76, 77%, but uh, he's not really been a playmaker and that's fine. He is that three and D mold that is going to pair up perfectly with Mo Wagner, with Paolo Bancaro, and maybe hopefully for them, it's Anthony Black as like the lead point guard for them and Jalen Suggs as that number two. I don't know what the Magic are going to do in the offseason. I've seen rumors for Clay Thompson, for Malik Monk, for Buddy Heald. Obviously, that team wants to add shooting. I would love like Jared McCain out of Duke in that draft, but I hope Suggs' role does not change next year. He is the perfect piece to have with Franz Wagner and Paolo Bancaro as that complimentary guy, as that glue piece, that good defender, good three-point shooter, hustle guy, and some like a player that every team needs. Like going back to Jalen Johnson, I wonder what his extension is going to look like, Jalen Suggs, like, and Jalen Johnson as well. Because I don't think it's like rookie max. Obviously, he's not rookie max worthy. Um, I wonder if like Franz gets that much. But I think maybe Franz, I don't know, like he's eligible. Maybe he gets like the Barrett, Darj Barrett Tower Hero extension and what that looked like. Um, but Suggs is going to get paid by the Orlando Magic, rightfully so. An underrated player throughout this league. And it surprised me in such a nice way this year. All right, next up for the most kind of surprising players list this year, I want to talk about Grayson Allen of the Phoenix Suns, man. So Grayson Allen, I was never a fan of at Duke. Obviously, I mentioned before, like liking Kobe White, I always preferred UNC over Duke. And I hated Duke, or I hated Grayson Allen at Duke. Obviously, he was somewhat of a dirty player then. Um, I hope he's kind of like, matured as a person and i like him now like i like him for the phoenix suns he was fine for utah in his rookie year i think showed some flashes was surprised he got traded to memphis but i'm actually just kind of going back was he in that mike conley deal he was i don't know was he no he was in the jay crowder deal oh no he was in the mike conley deal okay going back to that wow that pick or that trade honestly pretty good for the memphis grizzlies they ended up with um grayson allen darius Baisley, jay crowder kyle corver and a first rounder that ended up being walker kessler obviously that pick ended up going to minnesota and then funny enough back to or, or back to utah there so um yeah they ended up getting that first rounder but either way grayson allen has had a relatively like i think normal career stretch so far 
was back as a late first rounder, as a senior coming out of Duke in that 2018 draft. Um, was known to be a very good shooter at Duke and obviously won a national title, I believe as a freshman there in 2015 with like the Juvenile Okafor teams. Uh, there was Tyus Jones, there was Justice Winslow, and Grayson Allen has turned into arguably the best three-point shooter in the league this season. Now, just looking at numbers this season, you can make an argument for that. Overall, obviously he's not better than Steph Curry or Damian Lillard, but someone that is shooting 47% from three, that is a solid field goal percentage, and this man is shooting 47% from three, leading the NBA on six attempts a night. He has been such a big piece to the Suns team that at sometimes has a very thin bench, and he has been as good as you can ask. Like them making that trade in the offseason for the Suns when they ended up obviously they got Bradley Beal and they made like the Aiden um trade to get Nurkic and then Bucks ended up getting Lillard. So they also got like Nasir Little and Grayson Allen in that deal. And obviously that was like the best part of it. I think them getting Grayson Allen is well worth going from Aiden to Nurkic than just getting Nurkic in general. Like Aiden, is, or excuse me, Allen has been so much more important to this team than um, Yusuf Nurkic. And I think even at times this year, Bradley Beal, like you have as good of a one-two punch in this league, a one-A, one-B with Kevin Durant and Devin Booker. And Grayson Allen has been phenomenal. Now his defense is not very good. I'm not a huge fan of it. Uh, there's times where he can get played off the floor or you got to hide him and put him on the worst defender. But man, I can't gloss over how good of a shooter he has been this year and how good of like a cost-effective player he has been for the Phoenix Suns. Because Grayson Allen's salary this year is not bad. It's $8.9 million and he's leading the league in three-point percentage. He's averaging 13 points, three assists, four rebounds a night, and he's shooting 50% from the field and 89% from the line. This man is 51, 47, 88 splits. That is absurd. He has been such a good shooter for the Suns this year. He's going to be an unrestricted free agent at the end of the year. The Suns can bring him back. Uh, they do have to go, I believe, into the second apron and go deep into the luxury tax to get him. So it's they're going to have to pay and tax on like basically every dollar spent to bring back Grayson Allen. Um, and I'm excited to see if they end up doing that. And I'm excited to see, like, I think he's going to be the X factor for the Suns in the playoffs. Like I'm going to do an X factor for every team in the playoffs. And I definitely think that Grayson Allen is that guy for the Phoenix Suns because he's someone that could just keep them in ball games with his elite three-point shooting and will be such a nice piece to have when you obviously don't maybe have KD, Booker, or Beal, one of those guys on the floor getting it going. So shout out to Grayson Allen this year. He's going to earn himself a lot of money this off season. All right, next up, I want to talk about Dante Exum of the Dallas Mavericks. Now, Exum maybe hasn't been as great of over the second half of the year than he was in like the first half. It's kind of inconsistent on who's going to show up every night for them. Is it going to be Exum, Derek Jones, Josh Green? Um, but I think just Exum coming back to the league this year after spending the last two years in Spain and Serbia was known to be a relative bust for his time in Utah. Cleveland was drafted, what, fifth overall in the 2014 draft. He had multiple knee injuries and it didn't look like he was really going to be much in the NBA and was always going to be like a year or an overseas player. Um, but shout out to Dante Exum having a role back in the NBA, man. Someone that's been a good, just spot up shooter for the Dallas Mavericks and a great piece to have shooting corner threes for Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving. Someone they can kick it out to and rely on to be somewhat of a three and D player for them. Like just averaging eight points this year, two and a half rebounds, two and a half assists. Like shout out to Dante Exum for that. Shooting 55% from the field, 52% from three and 77% from the line. That is as much as you can ask for for somebody that hasn't played in the NBA in two years. His contract is $3 million this year and $3.1 million next year. And just having Exum, who's still just 28 years old, he's still fairly young, um, in your rotation on that cheap of a contract that can knock down threes for you and play like 16 to 20 minutes a night, basically what he's been doing this year for the Mavs. And hopefully like he can heat up for the playoffs and be a consistent three-point guy. Something like Luka really hasn't had since Seth Curry. And that Seth Curry for Josh Richardson trade did not work out for the Mavericks whatsoever. And I don't think like hindered Luka's development, but I think it definitely helps having a guy that Luka can kick it out to. Um, just a bench like shooter for them. Um, like he played well against Houston. They blew him out the other night. Perfect from the field. Knocked down all three of his three point attempts. Finished with 13 points in 18 minutes. Like that's what the Mavericks need Exum to be. And that's what he's been for them this year. So shout out to Dante. I wanted to put at least one rookie on this list because I did put a rookie on the disappointing players list and that was Scoot Henderson. So I want to talk about Gigi Jackson of the Memphis Grizzlies, a player that I thought should have stayed another year of college. He should have entered the transfer portal. He originally committed to UNC, decommitted, went to South Carolina and had a very disappointing uh, freshman year there. He was one of the top prospects coming into that draft. He was so young too because I believe he reclassified. Um, and he was 18 years old. He is still just 19 right now. Um, averaged around like 15 and a half points, six rebounds at South Carolina last year, but did not shoot the ball well whatsoever. Was below average from the line, below average from three, and below average from the field. There were some lapses on the defensive end. There were some character issues. And I thought should have stayed another year at South Carolina. Declares for the draft 
ends up being the 45th overall pick. I would not have spent a first rounder on him because I thought there were a lot of question marks. And I thought he should have stayed another year at South Carolina. Helped or stayed another year playing college basketball. Probably thought he should have transferred, but he could have helped his draft stock and been a first round pick in a much weaker 2024 draft class. But no, he declares he's a second round pick by the Grizzlies. Doesn't really play right away. And obviously probably didn't plan on playing at all this year. And the Grizzlies probably told him that. And he was going to spend some time in the G League because they were a team that was hopefully competing for a championship with John Morant, Triple J, Desmond Bain, and Marcus Smart. But all of those guys have been relatively hurt this year. John Morant was suspended. Desmond Bain has dealt with injuries. Marcus Smart has dealt with injuries. John Morant, going back to him, also out for the year with a shoulder injury. There's been injuries to Steven Adams before he got traded. He was out for the year. Brandon Clark's been injured. And we've seen guys like I could also mention Vince Williams, a year two man breaking out this year and the increased opportunity. But I wanted to talk about Gigi Jackson, man, really stepping up and looking like a building block for this Grizzlies future. 13 points, four rebounds over a system night, shooting 43% from the field, 36% from three, mainly doing this as an 18 year old. Like he recently turned 19 two months ago, three months ago. So like part 18, part 19 this year, still super young and has been a nice kind of piece in what is a very dark year for the Memphis Grizzlies. The Grizzlies signed him to that four year second round deal. He's making $1.9 million this year, $1.8 million next year, $2.2 million in 2026, and $2.4 million in 2027. Um, like I said, though, there could be some playmaking issues with him, but I think just like as a bench score, this is perfect for Memphis. Like this is a team that's going to have most likely a top 10 pick. They could have some wiggle room on what they want to do this offseason. I've kind of gone in my head like I would love a sign and trade if they could end up getting Nick Claxton. That'd be pretty sick. Like, or that'd be pretty sick. You have Triple J and Claxton in that front court. And like Gigi Jackson and also shout out to Vince Williams. Guys that have surprised me this year that are going to be real like bench players for them next year playing meaningful minutes. That is a massive upgrade over what David Roddy was for them before he got traded. Jake Loravia this year. Um, and definitely Zaire Williams who looks like a bust of the 10th overall pick from that 2021 draft. So great job to Memphis finding that, I guess, talent still in G Jackson. And probably in their minds, they were going to be pretty patient with him. They've expected, or he has exceeded expectations this year by far. So wanted to give him some love and a good pick there by the Grizzlies in the second round. So shout out to Zach Kleeman. Let's go to Utah for my next player here. And I'm going to talk about Colin Sexton, who I think going into this year, uh, he was in the Donovan Mitchell trade definitely like was out of the spotlight from that deal because Lowry marketing broke out and looked like a great return for Utah getting marketing, getting what could still be in Sexton and all that draft capital. Oshag Baji didn't really work out, but it didn't matter. Um, I think Sexton had a very, um, I guess, weird year first year in Utah, but when this happens, like it's going to be, I think, a rehab year because. Sexton missed basically all of the 2022 season, and that's what sparked the Cavs to make that deal. Um, he was obviously drafted in the top 10 in 2018. The Cavs found probably a better guard in the 2019 draft in the top 10, getting Darius Garland. They saw a opportunity to upgrade that positional value massively going from Sexton to Donovan Mitchell. And Sexton was kind of like all over the place in his um, first year in Utah. Spent some time on the bench, some time in the starting lineup. But the efficiency and the underlining numbers look good. Sexton was always kind of like a weird prospect coming out of Bama because he's 6'3", but I don't think was ever good enough of a playmaker to be like a true point guard. That's what he was kind of drafted to be. And then there was a backcourt of Garland and Sexton in um, Cleveland. Sexton had a phenomenal year in the 2021 season. Like I like when I was diving into this, I was like, wait, I forgot he averaged 24 points on pretty good efficiency for that 2021 Cleveland team. Um, they ended up getting Evan Mobley in that draft. 2022, um, like I said, he got hurt. Last year was up and down in Utah. But this year, man, he's played more minutes tonight. He has started way more games. He's been healthy, which is huge for Sexton. Has started 48 games out of 75. Even if he's coming off the bench, he's been good. Shooting 49% from the field. 40% from three on four attempts a night. An elite free throw shooter. Well, I wouldn't say elite, but really good. 86% from the line on five attempts a night. Hell yeah, Colin Sexton getting to the line a ton. The playmaking has improved. He's averaging five assists a night and 19 points per game. Um, I guess Jazz fans can let me know, like, do you prefer him to be kind of the one going forward or off ball a little bit and playing the two? Like, I don't know if Keontae George is going to be like the franchise point guard. I mean, he's kind of shown that in his rookie year. Um, but then the Jazz may have a first round pick. They may not. Could they be like, they have all this draft capital. Could they acquire a point guard in the off season? Would they be interested in like a DeJounte Murray or Trey Young if one of them became available or Josh Giddy as well, potentially. But I think Colin Sexton definitely deserves some love this year for how much he's improved from his first year in Utah. All right, next up, I want to talk about D'Angelo Russell of the LA Lakers. And you're still getting like the full D'Angelo Russell experience this year where there are like a ton of inconsistencies. And he's been, I think, a little bit more inconsistent in the second half of the year. But what D'Lo was, for this Lakers team kind of leading up to the trade deadline I think has 
definitely made me view him as a different player this year. And you could say he's been, I don't know, the third most important player on this Lakers team outside of AD and LeBron. Like you can make an argument he's been more important than Austin Reeves this season. Like D'Lo, there was a stretch from like middle of January to the beginning of March, excuse me, where he averaged 23 points, six and a half assists, shot 85% from the line, 46 from three, and 48% from the field in 36 minutes a night, over a 25 game sample size. Um, like like kind of since then, he's been a little bit like inconsistent, like kind of looking at his shooting splits a little bit as of late, 46 from the field, 21%, 43%, 31%, 30%. And it's not like you're getting elite playmaking, but you're getting solid playmaking from Devo this year. And you're not getting elite defense by any means. And there is still problems with his shot selection that's always been there throughout his career. But you know, overall this year, I think Devo has been a very good player for this Lakers team. And there was a reason why he didn't get traded at the deadline. And I think we looked at like what Mikel Bridges did in a small sample size last year for the Nets, and we thought he could do that over a full 82 games this year. We didn't see that. But Devo's sample size last year is just 17 games after the deadline for the Lakers in the regular season. He's kind of replicated those numbers. 17 games last year in around 30 minutes a night. Um, he is he shot 48% from the field. This year, shooting 46%, but he's taking more shots this year. He shot 41% on six and a half threes over those 17 games last year for the Lakers. 42% on seven threes over 69 games for the Lakers this year. Uh, he's improved the free throw shooting. I think the playmaking has honestly gotten a little bit better. But like I said, there'll always be question marks with his uh, shot selection. He's gonna be inconsistent at times. But honestly, I think I thought D-Lo was gonna be a net negative for this Lakers team. I thought he was gonna get traded at the deadline because of poor play but you know what the Lakers have kept him around and I think he's been surprising this year in a good way he's still not like an elite player by any means but I think my perception on him has changed a little bit I was I always thought he was kind of overrated um I, I liked him out of um out of Ohio State but like his first early years in LA they were fine I thought like his 2019 Nets scene Nets like uh season a little bit overrated obviously he wasn't great with the Warriors, um, then got traded to Minnesota. Obviously, he was out of the spotlight a little bit. Now back in LA, he's been good. I wanted to give d his flowers this year because I've kind of been harsh on d in the past, and I think he's been relatively good this year for the Lakers. So shout out to d All right, so my last spot here kind of goes to two guys for the overall theme of health. Two guys that have been relatively hurt in the past over the last, I guess, four or so years and have been healthy. Not going with this year, healthy this year. First guy I want to talk about is Zion Williamson. Zion Williamson, that was always the big question mark. Will he stay healthy? 24 games as a rookie in the 2020 season did not start basically till kind of the middle point before the season shut down um 2021 he appeared in 61 games out of 72 okay He's taking a step in the right direction did not play at all not at all in the 2022 season and then started off in the 2023 season healthy and then pretty much only ended up playing 29 games unfortunately which is kind of crazy he ended up being an all-star in those 29 games so i guess shout out to zion there um and then this year you know what he's been healthy he's gonna he already hit a career high in games he's at 64 right now he's in proved this year as a playmaker as point zion he's like his scoring isn't what it was in the 21 and 23 seasons but he's still averaging 23 points a night five assists like i said point zion has been very fun to watch this year six rebounds been efficient in the paint 58 percent and he still looks very good inside we'll still see kind of what his overall role is going to be for the Pelicans long term, but he got that extension with some like injury like clauses in there. And you know what? Zion's been healthy this year. So I wanted to give him some love. And another guy this year that's been healthy that hasn't been in the past, Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi Leonard has played 68 games this year. This is the most we have seen since the 2017 season, seven years ago, seven years ago. So yes, we hopefully knock on wood again, have a healthy Kawhi throughout the playoffs, something we didn't see last year, basically, something we didn't see at all in 2022. He got hurt in the 2021 playoffs. Um, so yeah, I'm just happy to hopefully see Kawhi fully healthy again. He's going to be an all NBA player for what he does on both ends of the floor. 24 points, six rebounds, three and a half assists, elite efficiency, 53% from the field, 42 from three, 89 from the line, and he's appeared in 68 games. Yeah, he's eligible for these all NBA awards and stuff like that and individual awards. He was an all-star this year. And he's probably going to eclipse 70 games. There was an injury scare a couple weeks ago. Um, I forget what it was initially, but there was a game where he left early. But you know what? He's been fully healthy again. And even if he's not like the Kawhi of old that we saw in Toronto, that's fine. I just want to see healthy Kawhi Leonard. And he's been a top 20 player in the league this year. In my opinion, top 15, deserves to be on an all-NBA team. 
I'm just glad that he's been fully healthy. So yeah, that is pretty much going to be my top 10 most surprising players this year in all good ways. Kobe White, Jalen Johnson, Jalen Williams, Jalen Suggs, Grayson Allen, Dante Exum, GG Jackson, Colin Sexton, D'Lo, and then for kind of health reasons, Zion Williamson and Kawhi Leonard. So I kind of just wanted to talk about the um, the men's kind of Elite Eight games and what we see now kind of going into the Final Four. I'm excited about this matchup. I mean, obviously there could have been a little bit more star power in this, but there's some fun storylines. So we're just going to recap kind of quickly my thoughts on Saturday's games. I mean, UConn beating Illinois 77-52. I mean, what's there not to say about UConn? They're a wagon. They were my prediction to win March Madness. This is one of the best college teams I think we've seen of all time. Pure domination from them this year, um, and they are just dominating the tournament, something they did last year. Their margin of victory from last year's championship run and this year's Final Four appearance, they're winning like on a margin of like 20 points per game. They went on a 30-0 run against Illinois, 30-0 run. Donovan Klingon has emerged from being one of the best players in all of college basketball. And they're just so much fun to watch. And Klingon is getting some draft type, man. He's like now projected to go top five in most mocks. And then Alabama continuing. Um, it's not a Cinderella run. I guess it would have been for Clemson a little bit. Um, they beat Clemson in a fun game. Um, I would have liked to see UNC UConn. I saw them play at MSG at the Jimmy V Classic earlier this year. I think that was like November around that time, maybe December. Um, but I, I was hoping to get a UNC UConn matchup. We're not going to get that. Definitely a little less exciting UConn Bama. Um, that I'll predict kind of my, I guess, I don't, I don't know. My, my national championship prediction is going to be Purdue UConn, right? Going up against, uh, against each other. But, um, yeah, it was still kind of a fun game between Alabama and Clemson. At least it was close. And I can't believe UNC blew that game against Alabama, man. And this Sweet 16, so bad. Withers with maybe one of the worst shots in all of the tournament. And then Sunday's game, we got a show out between um, Dalton Connect, a senior, and Zach Eady, a senior as well. I guess Connect's like a fifth year. Uh, so much fun. I mean, Purdue ended up winning 72-66. You can say what you want about Eady and the whistles and the foul calls, and they are there, and I, I get them. But still put up 40 and 16 in a lead eight game. Like, he's been the best player in college basketball this season, either you like him or not. And someone that's been top three or yeah, number two or three, I think up there with like RJ Davis, at least if you're looking at the whole season, Dalton Connect, who put on another show and is a for sure top 20 pick, could end up in the lottery, could have even end up in the top 10. Um, and then I'm going to NC State beat Duke, man. I mean, Duke had a nice win against Houston, even though Jamal Sheed ended up getting hurt, their best player, Houston, in the first half. But Jared McCain shot the ball very well. But DJ Burns, man, he's the story of college basketball. It's been super fun to watch. Um, and I hope NC State beats Purdue. It's going to be a fun as game, I'll tell you that, um, to watch Burns go up against Edie in that post. And we'll see how they defend them. It would be cool to see NC State pull off the upset. They are nine-point underdogs. I'm going to bet that it's going to be Purdue. UConn, and UConn's a 12-point favorite in the Final Four, which is crazy, but um, either way, Purdue-UConn, if that is the national championship game, should be very fun. And then I just quickly wanted to talk about the women's Elite Eight games that I, I watched on Monday, and I want to say this is pretty much the only women's games I've watched this year outside of some Caitlin Clark, like Iowa games, like when she broke records and stuff. Um, so I'm a very, very, I don't even think I'm a casual women's college basketball fan. I am not really uh, like involved in it too much, so I just wanted to say, like, it was super fun to watch, like, big game feel, like, watch the LSU um, Iowa game last year in the tournament, and watching Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark again, super fun. Caitlin Clark set records in this game, so I'm glad I watched it. She also had 12 assists. Uh, she knocked on a ton of threes, had 41 points. Um, and Iowa won 94-87. It was a very fun game, nonetheless, um, and had a big game feel to it. And then UConn USC also super fun as well. Juju Watkins is going to be so much fun to watch over her career at USC because she's only a freshman right now and is a top five player in all of women's college basketball. You could even say top three. And then Paige as well on UConn had 28 points, 10 rebounds, six assists. There's a chance UConn wins in both the men's and the women's. It would be kind of cool if that happens. I mean, that was just the Elite Eight games. It would have been cool if those were the Final Four matchups. So it's like sad to see like Juju and USC go home early. Angel Reese and LSU go home early. But we're going to get some good Elite Eight games because you got South Carolina, who's undefeated. Uh, they're a wagon of a team this year going up against NC State. So hey, NC State could also win both the men's and the women's, which would be kind of cool as well. So yeah, I just wanted to give my thoughts on opinions on those kind of college matchups as we're getting towards the women and men's final for uh, this upcoming weekend. So I hope you guys did enjoy this episode of the Just Ballin' Podcast. I will see you guys tomorrow for a Wednesday episode as well. Going to kind of go Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday this week, um, and then hopefully go back to Monday, Wednesday, Friday next week. I will be on the road well, I guess I'm traveling. I don't want to say on the road. I'm flying to Atlanta. I'm going to uh, Mets Braves in Atlanta. First time in Atlanta, the battery. So if you are from Atlanta or have been there and you have any suggestions, please let me know. I'm seeing a Mets game. Oh man, they've been so bad this year as a Mets fan. I, I kind of knew it though. I'm seeing the Mets play the Braves Monday night and then 
I'm going to watch kind of like the national championship game. And then I'm going to, I think it's Heat Hawks. I think the Hawks are playing the Heat. Because I know they play the, yeah, it's Heat Hawks Tuesday game. Hopefully I'm going to do something with the Hawks broadcast because I've worked with them in the past and that would be super cool. And then flying back to Philly on Wednesday. But I hope you guys have been enjoying the content. Uh, feel free to drop a thumbs up if you're on YouTube. Let me know maybe your most surprising player this year um, in the comments. And then if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, I would appreciate a rating and review. It um, means a ton. or just following. It takes two seconds and it helps the podcast grow. So love you guys a ton and I'll catch you guys in tomorrow's episode. Peace.